Thank you, Jesus. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we don't apologize for anything old. We just thank God that you're the same. What you were, you are, and you ever will be. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. We're going to have a little test this morning. Yeah, uh, the last the last classes uh, was just a brief one, but how about what is the communion of the Holy Spirit? Sure, you can cheat. I, we're not, we're not going to take scores on this. We're going to discuss it so we remember it. It's just a, a helper to help us zero in on it and then maybe remember it, right? Okay, so what is the communion of the Holy Spirit? Praise the Lord. Get that out of the way. Well, when we commune with somebody, what do we do? Fellowship. Partnership. Right, we got it. Participation and sharing. Communion of the Holy Spirit. Right. Communion is having an ongoing fellowship with him. When we have communion as the um, ordinance of the church, it is a fellowship with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. Next, what does sealed by the Holy Spirit mean? <laughs> what? Sealed. Stamped with a seal, right? You're marked. You're branded. That's a good one. Yeah, you're branded. So I don't wonder why people know that you belong to him. Because there's a brand on you. A spiritual brand. Holy Spirit. We're sealed. It, that's right. It shows who you are. Okay. Then who baptizes us into the body of Christ? The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. Right. Very good. And then what is the supply of the Spirit? If we talk about everybody bringing their supply of the Spirit. Helper. Further supply. When we all come together, we have more of the... Yeah, more more of the Holy Spirit. So our supply of the Spirit is important. Sometimes people think it's not important if they go to church. But it is important when you come together in the church as fellowship because you bring your supply of the Spirit, and whether you recognize you have one or not, it is important to the whole body that your supply comes because it makes the embers glow and catch fire. Amen? That's, that's a good point. That's a good, if you have a recipe and you're making a cake and everybody comes but the eggs, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh oh, that's very good. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what is the earnest of the Holy Spirit? The down payment. Right, so if the Holy Spirit is the down payment, this is what I always think of, what is the rest of it? Because the Holy Spirit is so wonderful, so great, so if he's just the down payment, what's the rest of it? We haven't even plumbed the depths of the Holy Spirit yet. So uh, we're just like having a, a snack here. Where we're not, uh, we've got to recognize there's just more available and more to come. Because we can get really complacent, can't we? In the fact that, oh, I pray in tongues and I do this and I do that and I read my Bible and ho hum. Uh, but it's a little different than that. I mean, if, he's, if this is just the down payment, how much more is there if we really press in? 
God's not withholding it, the supply of the Spirit. He's not withholding the amount of the Holy Spirit. I, I remember I, I taught a message a long time, quite a while back, on the, the capacity of a human being to hold spiritual things. Now, if the demon from Gadara had a legion of demons, the demoniac from Gadara, he had a legion of demons, there was a lot of room in there, wasn't there? So the Bible says to us on the flip side of that that we are filled with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, how big are we inside spiritually? What? We have a good capacity. We can have a lot more of God within us. We can yield to that. We can uh, fan the flames. We can get ourselves on fire because we have a capacity. I think probably uh, when I think of some of the great names that we go back in history, John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, uh, these uh, Catherine Kuhlman, I was just talking to somebody about her the other day, and all these these people that we look at like, wow, wow, well they, but we're just us. No, we are able to have everything that they had. We just need to, and we can have more. We have to press in. We have to seek him. He says if we seek him, we shall find him. Okay, so the down payment. Oh, I love that. That's the down payment. What is the whole thing? Woo. And then uh, what does justified in the spirit mean? Just as if I'd never sinned. Right. Justified. That brings us into the righteousness, receiving the righteousness of the gift of righteousness. Uh, just as if I'd never sinned. And then w what is the term bears witness? What does that mean? Like a legal term. Well, we talked about it and regarding the Holy Spirit. We say, I bear witness to this. The scripture, Paul says in some places, I bear witness uh, to this. That means that his spirit agrees with or bears witness to what's being said. And to be led by the spirit, we need to know the difference between this bearing witness and not bearing witness. We can hear somebody preach, but uh, sometimes we don't bear witness. What's coming out of their mouth may be, okay, but we just don't bear witness to it. I remember years ago, there was this guy that came to our church. And I was young in the Lord. And uh, he was preaching, and he was a real handsome dude, very uh, cocky and arrogant. And so you try not to look at the vessel. And he was preaching, and he was preaching a pretty good message, to my estimation, but I just didn't bear witness to it. I just... There was something about him that I just I just couldn't receive from him. I just, oh, there was something there. And as it turned out, he was very lust-filled and caused a lot of problems in our church. It was a spirit of lust. And uh, so I was learning all the time. It wasn't that I was being critical or condemning. It was that my spirit didn't bear witness. The words like the talking mouth sounded okay, but something wasn't there or there was something else there that wasn't what he was saying. So that bearing witness is a part of being led of the Holy Spirit. It's a, like a, yes, it's like a discernment. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say uh, there's a discerning of spirits, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, bearing witness was more, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit comes when God gives it to us, through the Holy Spirit. The gifts come for the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They come when, when God gives it to us when we need it. Bearing witness is more like a, like a everyday communication that, that we have. 
Uh, we might go into, uh, have you ever been in a store, walked into a store, and you do not like that store? There's something in that store that just bothers you. you there, I mean, you couldn't find, even if you wanted something, you, you really, it's just, that's kind of, I just, that doesn't set well with my spirit. There's something wrong. I've been in places like that where I'm just like, oh, there's something wrong here. And I don't want to do business here. i got to get out of here. I'll leave. And uh, sometimes we think we're just being critical or maybe we don't feel good. But there is something that will that can attack us when we go into a place like that. So that reminds me. And you know, a lot of these attacks can come when you're sitting in church. I mean, we want to be aware in the community, but we should be aware in the community. But uh, in, when you're sitting in church... I remember I was at a ladies' meeting one time, and I was, um, I think it was second row. I always like to sit up front because I, I just like to sit up front. I wanted to be close to the glory or whatever was going to be there. I wanted to be up front. And I didn't get as distracted. If I sat in the back, I was distracted by what other people were doing, you know, picking their nose, scratching their head, and you know, twitching around. And so uh, I was in the second row, and uh, this woman was teaching, and it was it was really, it was an awesome meeting. Presence, we felt the presence of God there. And then all of a sudden, bam, I got sick of my stomach. And I felt like I was going to barf immediately. And I went, what is this? Uh, what is this? I just knew it was like an attack. And I looked around, and I looked down the row, and there was a young woman down the row and she was leaning out looking at me, and she had this most weird grin on her face. It was really quite demonic. She was staring at me, and I went, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, you filthy spirit. I don't receive this. And she snapped back into her place, smiling, and I was fine. Yeah, those are weird things. I mean, I could have stayed and went and barfed. But it just didn't bear witness. That just didn't seem right. I was not sick when I went in there. And then, boom, get hit like that. And then it was just so unreal to look at her, and she was just leering at me. Ah, it was so strange. So I've learned that it, all things are not always well in the house of God. There are demons to be dealt with. Sometimes we need to bind those spirits and move on about our business because uh, they can really distract us from the word of God. And I never said again another thing from her. When the meeting was over, she was gone. I never even looked for her. It was just, and I can still see it in my mind's eye, her face down that row. I was like, oh, what is this? So I was attacked, I think. What do you think? Attacked, okay. All right. Okay, so any other comments? You may have had experiences. Okay. Well, they come in with the people, and the presence aggravates them. The presence of God aggravates them, and they manifest. We had that happen a lot uh, in our in churches over the years, Bible studies. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the guy you brought from school, from high school? We're kind of on a bunny trail, but he was a Satanist. And he was so proud of his Satanism. And you invited him to church, right? He was a student of yours. To my knowledge, he never got saved, I don't think. But we don't know. Uh, I don't know that. But he brought him up and he was a Satanist. And he actually went to the altar. Like, he was pretty attentive to the to the lot. And he never turned around, well, he turned around and said to me, and I told Pastor, I never saw up there this sort of power. It's been this more power than I've ever been confronted with. And he's just dumb, I mean, powerful. He's 
I recall he was almost panicky. He was, right. yeah. So I, I believe that he got saved after that. When you recognize that power, when I got delivered, and I recognized that I had a demon, and the power of God could cast that out over the telephone. It wasn't respective of anybody having to be there. And uh, by a word, I felt it leave me. Then I realized, that's a lot of power here, more than I've been doing within the occult. I mean, this is a lot of power, which then enabled me to receive Christ uh, because of that dealing and when that spirit left me. So, yeah, but I remember that. I mean, he said he had never had seen that much power, and he was totally wiped. I mean, it really bothered him. Unnerved is a good word. Unnerved, yeah. Yeah. So, praise the Lord. Uh-huh. And I don't think I can think of what I just said Jesus. And the demon stopped and went the other way and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean there there are some attacks. We can get attacked. Uh it's not looking for it all the time, but when something odd like that happened, I mean if you had accepted that you'd have been in the hospital. Yeah, so it's a yeah, it's a thing of the spirit. Okay, uh, that's fun, huh? I don't know how we got off on that, but it was it was good because with the Holy Spirit, He gives you the uh, discernment, He gives you the uh, revelation, He bears witness with your spirit, like whoop, this is okay, this isn't okay, this is okay, this isn't okay, so. And I've found that if I just go with that, if I walk into a store and I get that sense, I'll leave. I go somewhere else. <laughs> Halloween coming up. <laughs> well, Halloween is only only when they show themselves a little more. Actually, they're they're still working every day, but there's more of us, more angels than there are demons. Remember that, and we have authority over them, just like Jesus did. So we do not have to tolerate that stuff. So I'm big into rebuking and binding. It works for me. That's a lot. Clean. Right. Clean out the house. Right. Yes. That's. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So then I open the door and then I'm out outside. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I'm just I'm just like, I'm afraid. And then you see it. But I'm like, you see it. And 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 i
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's very important. And when people come to your house to visit or come to stay for a visit, uh, you have to recognize when they leave, uh, you may need to do a little house cleaning and uh, spiritually. Or, yeah, when they're there, you also may have to set your room apart as a sanctuary. I've had that happen before. Because they are what they got, and uh, I'm going to sleep. I'm, I'm not going to foolish this stuff, right? They use. You don't learn. Right. Right. And we learn a lot from each other. And when we, like, I love this class because when we, when I give an experience, uh, experience or she gives an experience, you, anybody gives an experience, another person has had a similar experience. So it helps someone else know, well, if it worked for them, two of them separately, maybe it'll work for me and uh, go on from there. So, yeah, it's, uh, we, you know, we've been having a lot of phone calls to the church about people wanting deliverance. I have a demon. I need to get delivered. I have a demon. I need to get delivered. And it's like, well, well, they're tormented. They're uh, doing things. Hearing, yeah, right. Voices, things are bothering them. I mean, some of it gets pretty, pretty hairy. But the challenge is that none of them want to come to church to get delivered. And they don't want to stay in church. And I've just kind of gotten... Uh, I don't, uh, I haven't been corrected yet, but it just occasionally there's one of them, and, and they have their own pastor, they have their own, they go to church, well, go to your own pastor. But I'm t- I told one lady, I said, you, if you come to church, you need to realize, she was, um, uh, what was she, a uh, spiritist, she was fortune teller. And she said, I, and I'm really tormented. And I said, well, you need to realize this. That if you're making money from that and you come and get delivered from it, there goes your income. So I'm just going to tell you, that's in the Bible. Do you ever read the Bible? She says, oh, no. And I said, okay, so you can lose your income. And I said, you need to stay with us in the church so you can be taught how to stand against this so you can have peace and you have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I never saw her. She never came. But sometimes, it's the Bible says, lay your hand suddenly on no man. Sometimes, and we did this as kids in the Lord. We, we delivered a guy, and, and uh, he didn't want to be delivered. But the power of God drove him out. And when he was empty from the demons, he went, oh, my friends are gone. I don't want to be alone. And the next time we saw him, he was walking the streets, homeless, and he was staring at the sun, screaming and hollering. I mean, it was seven times worse. And so we said, uh, we think this is not always a good idea to be just delivering people from demons because if they like them, they don't want to be delivered. Then it gets worse. And, I mean, so it's an interesting thing. But you have the authority. We do have the authority. So. Well, you got to follow the Holy Ghost. And sometimes you will pray for people, and they will still go off on their own. I mean, they're going to do what they want to do. They're going to get thrown in. We had one girl in here, remember, when she came in? And the demon manifested and cast the devil out of her. And and then she made a trip. And when she came back, her parents wouldn't bring her because it was too far a drive. But all they did was complain about her screaming all night long and this torment. But they wouldn't bring her to church so we could teach her. So then her boyfriend brought her one time, if you remember. And she was still trying to keep it at bay. But she had no... Yeah, she just didn't have the teaching. She didn't have the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit. She wasn't sitting in church under that power. And so uh, we, haven't, we haven't seen her since then. It's a sad thing. 
uh, it's a sad thing. It makes no sense, does it? If you're up all night with a kid that's screaming and hollering and, and demon-possessed and she had a baby, uh, just they were living together. Yeah, the sisters were also... Mm-hmm. The sisters were also tormented, and, uh, and uh, you get them cleaned up, then they won't bring them back. Parents are the worst enemies of their children. It's too far to drive. Sure. Yeah. No. So it's it's a it's a mindset that uh, I just. I tell them, well, we're at church at this time, and this is what's going to happen. And if you won't give your life to the Lord, then. And. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go tell them. And if they choose to come or not, it depends. And they can override the demonic spirit within them. They can't to come to Christ. Okay, we'll start our class now. Praise the Lord. That was that was fun. Uh, well, well, we kind of went off on this little, but we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, moving into that, as we have been talking about the Holy Spirit uh, as a person with personality and and uh, what he brings to us. And, and I don't know, uh, I could study the Holy Spirit forever and ever. I could teach on the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Every time I've taught, people kind of get a little tired of it, but the Holy Spirit is so precious and brings to us everything that it's important to to learn about him. Even though we're spirit-filled, we think we know him, but we don't really know him. Uh, we, we know about him, we have him, but we don't know what to do with him. And so then we, it has to work out in us because fear will keep us from moving with the Holy Spirit. Our mind will take over and say, oh, you're just critical. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of things that we have to be able to override to recognize how the Holy Spirit works. So let's look at Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Um, now we're going to go through the, the fruit of the Spirit. And I teach it a little differently than I've heard it taught because to me the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit. It's not plural, but it's always taught plural, like love is a fruit, joy is a fruit. They're all separate fruits. And I don't have a problem with that, but the concept, because of the, the way it's spoken of in, his, in, in Scripture, is that it doesn't say it's fruits. It says fruit. The fruit. So somebody read Galatians 22 and 23, please. That's great. Okay. They may hate you for it, but <laughs> they may not like it, but it's not against the law yet. <laughs> it's true. I love that part of that scripture. Against such things, there is no law that can bring a charge. All right, so the fruit of the Holy Spirit is produced in and out of the believer's spirit. So this is the total character of Jesus Christ being produced in the total life of the believer. So it's his character becoming our character or us becoming more like him or him becoming more. What did John the Baptist say? He said... I must decrease, he must increase. Yes, empty me of me so I can be filled with you. Yes, so that's what we're kind of looking at. 
and it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to produce openly all the portions of the complete character of Jesus. And so all the parts of the fruit spring forth by the influence of the Holy Spirit. We cannot make ourselves this way. We can try, but, I mean, some of us are more faithful than others. The fact that we uh, usually go where we're supposed to go and sort of things. I mean, some people are more optimistic than others. We're not talking about um, our character, our own natural character, our own natural uh, strength. We're talking about the, the character and the, and the fruit of, of Jesus. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. All right, so fruit, where we're zeroing in on fruit. So fruit is defined as that which is dry and ripe, ready for action, the produce, and the result. It is the result of all parts working together. If one part is missing, there is a deficiency. Now, the construction of the word fruit in the Greek does not permit saying that love alone is the fruit. It's like I said, it's not that it's by itself. Rather, it's all the parts of the spirit are valuable. And they work together to bring a harmony to the believer's existence spiritually and work in our natural life. So there's a fruit. The parts can't work independently of each other, but they have to work together at the same time. So it's not fruit by the original Greek. It's fruit. Yes? So what we're talking about, about fruit, basically you have one fruit That's, that's right. To make a complete fruit. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And we're going to address the pieces. Because as we look at it, the first one mentioned is love. Well, love is the core of the fruit. Think about an apple. Think about even an orange. Like you said, an orange. It's got that little place in the middle where everything comes together. Uh, it does it pretty good, too, right? Your quilt was a little off, but that seems to be a little on, always the orange, always stars out together, doesn't it? All right. So the word agape in the Greek, it means affection or benevolence, uh, a love feast, feast of charity, to de be dear or to love, to delight in, devotion, generosity, kindly concern, value, esteem, generous concern for, uh, to set store upon, to cherish with reverence, to acquiesce, to be quiet, to accept or comply without words or speech, with satisfaction. So there is this word for agape, love. And this is the kind of love that God has. Uh, the English word for love is very shallow. English is more of a technical language. Even if you if you know Spanish or French or Italian, you have more uh, embellishment. You have more uh, emotional definition in, in the words. And so, uh, I mean, we can say we love our dog or we love cookies, but that doesn't mean that we really love them. It's probably that we like to eat them, but... I mean, we're not in love with them because they're an animate object. You say, well, I could be in love with an inanimate object, well, but not like God is in love with his people. Agapeo love. It's the type of love, a new type of love that was expressed in Christ. And it's an expression of love that had not been known prior to the giving or the incarnation of Jesus Christ. When God sent Jesus to the earth, when he was begotten of a virgin by the Holy Ghost, 
he demonstrated God's love. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, we say, well, that's when he went to the cross. Yes, but it's also when he gave him into the earth. He let him come here. You don't think that he uh, missed him? I'm sure. I mean, that was a whole different setup right there than sort of like sending your kids off to school, yeah. So the word agapeo expresses ideas <laughs> that were previously unknown. So let's look. Uh, Roberta, get John 17, 26. And uh, Cheryl, get John 3, 16. <laughs> I just said it. But. And uh, Nathan, if you would get Romans 5, 8. And then, um, well, if you would get John 14, 21. That'll take us uh, a, a, a fur piece. A fur piece, like my grandma used to say. John, hmm? John's your underway, a fur piece, yeah. A fur piece. Grandma used to say that. We all have roots somewhere, don't we? Ooh, that is so good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, Amplified says, I've made your name known to them and revealed your character and your very self. And I will continue to make you known that the love which you have bestowed upon me may be in them, felt in their hearts, and that I myself may be in them. All right, so this describes the attitude of God towards his son. And his son was in that relationship. He knew how God felt about him. And then in John 3.16... Yes. So this is his the picture of God's love towards the human race. Mm hmm mm hmm All right. Romans five eight. You have that, Nathan? always just grabs me. So this kind of love that God has towards us loved us before we knew him. He, in fact, Jesus was the lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world. So God's love was already working in his plan of creation and mankind. Uh, man was his crowning glory. And so uh, he loved us while we were still sinners. His enemies working against him. This always gets me. Not only did he know it, when he spoke it into existence, it was already done. From before the foundation of the world, there would be nothing that would change that. 
Man was created in God's image, and man fell. God didn't go, oh, I need another plan. Oh, I didn't expect this to happen. But see, to see that, we have to recognize how big God is outside of our finite thinking. Because when it was from before the foundation of the world, then he knew it all. Right. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that helps you. <laughs> but the God had agreed together before it ever existed that it was worth it. You were worth it. Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus went to the cross, and he saw with joy. Us. What's the song? When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. The Hebrews says that he saw us and he did it with joy. The joy set before him. He had no clue. But he didn't know it because he was of a different spirit. And Satan's spirit was a lustful, grasping, greedy spirit. And I'm going to hurt God because I'm going to kill you and all of those things. And you're... Yes, he did. Yeah, played him for a fool. Yeah. So, but that's, see, the whole plan was already in existence, and when he spoke it, it became. It's, it's a really interesting. The Lord was showing me something the other night about his why he exalts his word above his name. And I was like, always wondered that. And I was like, oh my gosh. I'll share it with you later. I'm still working on it. It's like, whew. I'm so excited. Like, whoa. Okay. Wow. The scripture says that God exalts his word above his name. And my thinking has always been, I don't have the scripture uh, with me right now. I, I've always been wondering, well, if his name is so powerful, what does that mean his word is? And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And here we have the same picture. It's a manifestation of the love of God that all he created, he created with love. And so... While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, it was went to whosoever will, John 3.16. So this is the kind of love that the devil doesn't have. He doesn't love. He lusts. Lusts. L-U-S-T-S. He lusts. Uh, he has a fondness for what will meet his need and benefit his plan. But God gave God gave because he loved, and he loved totally unlovable, unworthy creatures that had already done horrible things from the garden. So, 
That's right, God is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Lust takes at someone else's expense to satisfy itself, which explains rape, murder, theft, all of these works of the flesh. Love gives at his own expense to benefit others. That's the difference you were seeing. Yes. And so that's that's the difference. So love said, I will die for you. Jesus said, scarcely would a man give his own life for anybody. It has to be a real rarity. And especially not your enemy. Right. And yet... Exactly. Mm -hmm. That comes into forgiveness, right? We have to forgive. Well, I mean, God, he, but his love does not endorse sin. His love is not permissive to endorse uncleanness. His love is healing. His love makes us holy. His love that, because most people have never had a touch of holy, the holy love of God. Even even uh, uh, children, uh, when we're brought up as children, if we're not brought up in the Lord, what were we said? If you do good, then mommy will love you. That's what I was raised with. Yeah, that was the reward. If you don't do good, mommy don't love you. Well, that made us very insecure because we couldn't always do good because we were kind of in that, yeah, we're imperfect beings. We couldn't always do good. So, all right, that was a good question. Okay, and John 14, 21. Ooh. Yeah, you want to read that again? You guys have my commandments and keep your commandments. He is he that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Right. So this 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 love uh is we've never it's fourteen twenty one, we've never dealt with this before. But then we would conversely say, if we don't keep his commandments, we don't love him. Right. If you love God, you will keep his commandments. It will not be hard for you. It will be a joy. Like if you love a person and they become sick or infirm, let's just take an example, you will not chafe at taking them to the doctors, sitting with them, uh, bringing things to them. Uh, you won't. It won't be a burden to you, right? If you really love that person. But uh, if you don't love that person, I mean, if you maybe if you lived with them for 40 years and you're married or whatever, but they get sick and it's too big a trouble for you, then how much love is there? What was there? Was there really a, a, a love or was it just convenience or a habit? And because I, I've told this story about the banker that we had years and years ago and how he got cancer and his they were, he was an elder in the church. I mean, he was a, and he was a great guy. He was a really nice man. He got cancer. His wife said, I didn't sign up for this, and she divorced him. I mean, 
boom. I didn't sign up for this. What happened for better or for worse? Did you have in your vows for sickness and health? I mean, it just shocked me. Of course. I mean, really, the cancer overwhelmed him because he had no, he lost his, yeah, he lost what he thought he had. And exactly, yeah. And, and he was a good Christian. I mean, he loved the Lord, but it just gutted him. Did impact me. How could, how could she do that? Uh, so, uh, and I wasn't trying to be judging. I just couldn't understand it. Uh, yep, yep, raised family, all that. Yep. And then he's, of course. In fact, right. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. You duplicate yeah, yourself. He wasn't even that bad when she did it. It was when he got the diagnosis. <laughs> I mean, it was just in the beginning. And he says, whoever really loves me then will be loved by my father, and I too will love him, and then I will reveal myself to him. Uh, I will let myself be clearly seen to him and make myself real to him. So to come into that place, like we were talking, the capacity of a human being to contain spiritual things. Uh, we're, we're talking about that the love that we have for the Lord uh, to, to keep his commandments uh, is not grievous. We will fight ourselves to make it happen. We will... Learn to forgive. I mean, we, it's hard work to forgive, but we will learn to forgive because Jesus said if we don't forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. Uh-oh. That means, uh-oh. Yeah. And so, I mean, we, we've got this, this thing. So, But the promise is that if we really love him, then we're uh, going to be happy to do for him. We're going to be happy to serve him. We're going to be happy to keep his commandments. We're going to be happy to be in his presence. We want to be in the house of God. I've always wanted to be in the house of God, always, from the time I got saved. It was crazy. I mean, it was just crazy. We rearranged our schedule, and we were there every meeting because we learned that if we weren't there, something happened, and we missed it. And so uh, it's... uh, you just want to be with him. Sure. Mm-hmm. 
That's true. That is true. One, one word. Yeah. What, what happened that you missed? That was personal to you. What happened? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know that God knows, and He knows if you can't get somewhere. But if you can be there, then you need to be there because you never know. The answer to your problem could be right there. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Yes. That's right. Yeah, doing the simplest thing. And like you said, that's how we learn. That's how we um, we see things happen. Yeah. We, we see things happen. Uh, those things change us. Yeah. Happened for me. Right. It builds your faith. Yeah. So, praise the Lord. So this love is is uh, a different kind of love. It's totally different. Um, next week we're going to talk about the other kinds of love. But we're, we're out of time today. <laughs> We've had a good time. But we're going to talk more about this love next week. And I'm not done with agapeo love. Uh, and when we talk about it, what it does, it helps us to realize how much God what kind of love God has for us, which means if you have been abused in your life with people saying they love you and they really just lust you, and then you turn around and you look at God and you think he's the same as everybody else, and people do that. You had a bad father. Now you have a good father, but you look at the good father like the parable of the talents where he said you were an evil man and you made money where you shouldn't have and so I hid your money in the ground I mean, he had a distorted view of who God was and God's love and so when we learn this type of love then we begin to recognize this is a whole different thing than we have ever dealt with we don't have to work for it we just have to receive it and recognize that it's going to make changes in us which are going to benefit us that agapeo love of God. Yes. Yes, we do have a pure love. Mm -hmm. We have, have, have a better comprehension of what love really is. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit dwelling with us, working with us, uh, contending with us even, and helping us, the great helper, the comforter, the paraclete. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place today. Please make yourself at home in us that we might walk in the presence today in this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey. Hi, I'm Pastor George Stover, and uh, I want to invite you to come and join with us as we build the kingdom of God at Wellspring Church of All Nations. We're located at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. There's also an entrance off of 4870 Janelle Drive. There is nothing more important to you and I today than the Word of God. If we, if we don't learn as a people, as a nation, to return to the Bible, to return to faith in Jesus Christ and Him and Him alone, we're, we're not going to have the country that we've had, the one that I grew up in. I want my grandchildren and uh, my children, your children and your grandchildren to live in the America I grew up in. But, you know, it's going to depend on us, the people of faith. We have to get into the Word and, and just stick with it. And uh, having done all, stand. And so we're really, really uh, in wanting you to come and just be a part of who we are, what we're doing here, because it's really all about you.